Hello and welcome to this first episode of Simplifying the Law, a new television program brought to you by the Government of Guyana through the Attorney General Chambers and Ministry of Legal Affairs in a bid to educate citizens on laws uh, that are being passed and already um, enacted so persons could offer themselves with uh, regulations and um, general provisions of the laws and uh, offenses. Um, the government has a very aggressive legislative agenda just this year from January um, until recently this month uh, over well 20 pieces of legislation were passed um, enacted by the parliament um, this is a heavy workload for the government and these are modern and complex laws and therefore it is imperative that persons are aware of what these laws are and what they entail offenses that they create because uh, as the honorable attorney general and minister of legal affairs mohobir anil nanlal recently said um, ignorance of the law is no defense and therefore he is pushing this initiative to ensure everyone is up to date and up to speed with what is happening um, the program will be a weekly program where we will touch on various pieces of legislation different legislation at different uh, weeks and we will look at topical issues and current affairs here we will feature state council and other officials from the attorney general chambers and other officials from the public sector the state agencies um, even the private sector and we might have uh, members from the private bar um, religious organizations and other persons come in to touch on issues in the law and simplifying the law with me today i have none other than the solicitor general mr nigel hawk and an attorney in waiting at the attorney general chambers Ms. shania Passad, who will help me to go through the motor vehicle and road traffic act um, we thought this is a significant starting point as recently there has been a number of road accidents and road fatalities and uh, we, there is a slew of legislation governing road traffic and, and motor vehicles which persons are not quite aware of um, last year in 2022 new offenses were introduced under this um, legislation such as motor manslaughter and new penalties new fines were introduced as well um, which we will touch on later in the program this year the 2023 amendment act introduced the electronic bikes or the e-bikes into the um the scheme of things and that now is being regulated as well so we're going to touch on a number of things and i hope this program could be as informing and enlightening as possible so before we get quite into it miss Passad has some statistics which she has prepared to, to show us the number of uh, road accidents and fatalities which has occurred so I'll just hand it over to her uh, so thank you Richard for having me on the show today um, so just like Richard said in Guyana there are a lot of road fatalities and even just now when I actually told them the statistics from January 1st to the 29th of June this year there were a hundred and two road deaths reported and that's insane given our Guyanese population we have less than a million people and I also read another statistic that said that between 2017 to 2022 there were over 600 road fatalities approximately each year there are usually like a hundred and something road fatalities and given that this is that was just half the year statistics between the 1st of January to the 29th of June 2023 102 fatalities and if we're to if continue the same way to the end of the year that's 200 and something persons that could possibly die from road fatalities which is crazy um i remember the attorney general saying that people on the roadways they use their vehicles as a lethal weapon 
and in Guyana we have all the laws as Richard said we recently had so many amendments this year we had the 2023 amendment which regulates now the e-bikes in 2022 there were the addition of more provisions and offenses um so mr hawk you have like anything you'd like to add so ladies and gentlemen we want to thank you richard and we want to congratulate the attorney general on um this uh timely initiative and certainly um we know that the statistics are kind of alarming and we know um we're in a state of border when it comes to road accidents and road fatalities and that is why i think these two kinds of programs will certainly um inure to the benefit of the general public in the sense of us from the chambers of the attorney general other members in the public sector and the private sector bringing information to the public so looking at it generally you would want to say um are we um in a state of um extreme chaos the answer is no but certainly what you're seeing from the legislative agenda of the government is that the government is at work we we've seen the the need to address some of these issues and we want to say at the outset to members of the public there are a lot of provisions already in the motor vehicle and road traffic act to address some of the deficiencies that we're seeing on our roadways some of the cause of concern and we'll name a few some of them that we see we see a number of drivers operating motor vehicles and they're not using their seat belts they're not um adhering to the rules as it relates to use of handheld devices those are just two examples but what we want to say is that in the motor vehicle and road traffic act we have provisions in the law to address issues in relation to the non-use or the improper use of uh, seat belts, the improper use of handheld devices, and more, more importantly, because what we're also seeing in the statistics, there are a number of children who are caught up in the, um, the statistics in relation to deaths. So child, the use of child restraints is uh, something that is important that we as citizens of Guyana need to think about and bring on board. So following on from what Ms. Um, Posada said, certainly I think um, the correct word that we, we ought to guard ourselves as she used it, is it, it, it borders line, it borderlines a kind of craziness, but we don't we don't want that's why we're having this program to curb that type of behavior. And it is our hope um, that through this program we'll be able to certainly help members of the public to understand um, some of the important pieces of legislation, but more particularly on this program, uh, issues which, which pertain to uh, the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act. And I want to start off by looking at a number of them. I just mentioned um, the issue of uh, the use, improper use of handheld devices. So let's let's break it down. We're talking about cell phones. We're talking about any device. It's a uh, cell phone or a, a tablet or a laptop um if you're going to be using those devices um whilst you're driving that is absolutely contrary to the uh motor vehicle and road traffic act and it is an offense and later on in the program as we mentioned we're gonna address the issue of e-ticketing because that is an, something that will loom large in relation to some of these offenses and also we want to address the issue now of some of the things that we're seeing on the roads in relation to the vehicles. Heavy tinting of vehicles um, when in fact the regulation requires and the laws require a certain percentage of tint in relation to the use of your motor vehicle. And it's becoming alarming that you're seeing on our roadways a number of persons traversing our roadways and using vehicles that are heavily tinted and you the other road users may not even be able to see into the vehicle to know who's the driver of that vehicle and it, it will play an important role because in some instances we're seeing now persons are tinting the entire um front windscreen um, and we don't know that that is um in accordance with the motor vehicle and road traffic act so certainly members of the public um has to become aware and we're, we're urging you to become aware that the the law requires only a certain percentage tint and i think the percentage that you require is 25 percent 
um, in accordance with the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act. So we're urging members of the public in relation to that to make sure that you're compliant when you go to those persons who administer the service to make sure that you indicate to them. And we, uh, as government, we also have to make sure that those persons who operate businesses dealing with Tintin make sure that the information is transmitted to them in relation to um, the percentage that is required by the law in relation to Tintin. But we're here more also to help you, members of the public, in relation to what may you may consider as your rights when you go and you use the road. What are some of your rights if you're if you're stopped by a traffic officer? Because you know we know it's a two-way street. It's not only the police. It's not only members of the public. We all have an obligation, especially given the circumstances, to make sure that we do our best as citizens of Guyana to curb the situation that we're seeing. So with that said, I'll, 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 I'll go back to you, Richard. Uh, thank you, um, SG. And <clears throat> if we could get straight into the legislation now, the Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Act. So there's a number of procedures and uh, offenses that are set out in within this um, legislation. And like you mentioned, the use of cell phone. But the first, I would, I would like to start at the basic, um, the issuance of a certificate of fitness for a motor vehicle. Recently, we've seen a number of vehicles on the road that some people might say may look unfit to um, be traversing on the roadways. So, however, before you can legally um, drive on the road there are certain requirements which must be fulfilled and certain documents which you must have in your possession first and foremost is that you you must be licensed to drive um the specific type of vehicle that you are operating and uh, you must have your certificate of fitness issued by the uh, by a certifying officer from the Guyana police force and yeah. and you must have your road license so if you could expound a bit on this certificate of fitness for us and sure. its importance sure certainly so your certificate of fitness is absolutely important um, because it speaks to roadworthiness of the vehicle or the particular motor vehicle so for example unless your your vehicle has not been inspected by what we know in the uh, Guyana Police Department as a certifying officer once a certifying officer has not certified your vehicle as roadworthy, your vehicle ought not to be on any public roadway or private roadway in Guyana. So you are required by law to have your vehicle properly certified. And you also raise an important issue. You may be licensed to drive. Let's say, for example, you may be licensed to drive a car, but not a van. But you might be driving a van but you're only licensed to drive a car that that is a double-edged sword and let me put it this and let me break it down when it's a double-edged sword first it means that you're not properly licensed that's number one and the second issue once you enter that vehicle and you drive that vehicle on the roadway because you're not licensed to drive a van you would would have automatically breached your insurance policy because the insurance policy basically contemplates a person who a person who's licensed to drive that particular vehicle. So the point that you raise there is an important one that we need to bring the public's awareness to that if you're certified to drive a car and van, for example, that doesn't give you the leeway to just go on our roadway with that particular classification in your license to then drive a truck or drive a minibus or drive a higher car. Um, a higher car. Um, so that is critically important and it's tied to the fact of you first getting your license and secondly making sure that your vehicle is properly certified and fit for road use. Now after you have been issued your certificate of fitness you are able to travel on the road, right. drive on the road. But we've seen some people making modifications to their vehicle now. The installation of these blinding blue lights and um, other glaringly blinding lights and, you know, putting on these heavily tint, as you um, mentioned. So 
how, how does this apply? Because they already got the fitness. Then they went ahead and make these modifications, which are not in compliance with the uh, fitness. Ca can this fitness be revoked or what is the procedure there? Your fitness can be revoked um, by the relevant certifying officer. In instances where, like the example you gave, I went and I got a fitness, the certifying officer looked at my vehicle, it was certified fit for road use, but at the time I had no addition of the blue lights, I, I, I didn't put, or my tint was maybe 25% as required by the law, but then after I leave and I'm properly certified and I go on the roadway, I then put it at a level of 90% or 80%, which is in total violation of the law. So if you are stopped by a police officer, your 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 certificate of fitness can possibly be revoked for purposes of non-compliance mm. with your certificate of fitness and the law in general. So you're not at liberty then to just go and alter issues on your vehicle. If you're to do that, you have to go back to the certifying officer to get the certifying officer's permission to do those things. In the instance in the instance of changing, you talk about changing. Let's say for example, people change uh, uh spray their vehicles but sometimes they don't go to the relevant statutory body which is the guyana revenue authority to indicate to them that my vehicle is no longer white because when you register your vehicle it will be registered and designated with the color that it came with so let's say it's designated white but when you go and you spray your vehicle you don't come back to the gra it's now a black vehicle that causes problems because it's a now a violation of the condition of your registration. So you ought properly members of the public to go back to the relevant authority, in this case if it's a changing of a color of the motor vehicle to gain a revenue authority. In the case of tinting and lights and other uh, alterations to the motor vehicle, the relevant certifying officer within your district. And what what is the penalty or are there any offenses like for example if I'm stopped at a stop and search or roadblock and it was identified that you know I have these blue lights um, what what can I be charged well you could be charged you could be charged and um, maybe you you required to pay a fine for violation of your uh, motor vehicle and road, um, your, your fitness um, requirements under the motor vehicle and road traffic act but at the end of the day what we're trying to do and especially this program, we're trying to sensitize members of the public because as the Honorable Attorney General has mentioned, ignorance of the law is no defense. So, okay, what we're saying to you today, members of the public, we're coming to you to bring the law to you say, okay, if you weren't aware, we're telling you now that you ought not to do that. And the proper thing for you to do is approach the relevant authorities in, this, in the case of the alteration to the vehicle, the certifying officer. But to answer your question, Richard, yes. You, you can be subject to a fine or possibly imprisonment. Okay, thank you. Now, another problem which has been prevalent is leaving vehicles in dangerous positions. Um, this has led to a number of accidents. We have seen trucks and trailers being parked recklessly at the side of the road or even cars, you know. They, they put on the, the hazard light and they stop anywhere and they think that is um, lawful. Okay, let's, could we touch a little bit on that? So um, in relation to um, these vehicles and parking of vehicles, and we've seen um, the situation where persons just put on their hazard and somehow um, the view now is that when you put on your hazard light, somehow that basically saves you from anything and doesn't create any danger. The reality is on the motor vehicle traffic act, you're creating an obstruction of the traffic. So that is an offense under the law and you could be charged and you could be placed before the courts, either pay a fine or serve a term of imprisonment. The reality that we want to address here with members of the public is that we want you to reorient and re-engineer your thinking and understand that we all have an obligation to make sure the traffic flows around our city. We know that we have a number of motor vehicles now. It's a different time. Persons are, are buying motor vehicles, but that doesn't mean because um, you can't find the parking that you must park anywhere or you must park in a way that is dangerous to the public. You can also be charged uh, uh, in, a, in a way if you park your vehicle, not only for obstruction of traffic, maybe for careless driving, right? But we need to make the point that the indication of your hazard light is really for other purposes, not for 
you just putting your hazard light on to say that you're parking because a lot of times when you see the hazard light on there's no danger the hazard is really to indicate that there's a danger i know in the traditional sense some people use the hazard when you have white rain because you know you might not be able to see visibility is poor you use your hazard light. that is a danger an example i'm using but for you to park your vehicle for a short moment to run into the supermarket to grab uh, some groceries and you block the traffic that wouldn't suffice in law as a a danger or hazard right so mostly it would be used in the case of where there are animals on animals the road on or... the roadway and so on right 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 so <laughs> earlier you mentioned the important issue of wearing seat belts, seat belts. this um a lot of people don't wear seat belts yeah. um, this this is a life-saving mechanism installed in a vehicle yeah. um, if we could touch base on the use of seat belts and more specifically child restraints because the law provides for child restraints yeah. so if you could enlighten us oh, with there. your permission i'll ask my um my colleague sure, right. um, yeah, yeah, to chime in on that sure, sure. Issue. um so there's this example with one of my friends a friend that we actually share he usually with his seat belt he would like stick it in at the back and whenever he see police come in <laughs> he would pull it over i mean we like spoke to him about that and he, he stopped it However, the, the law is there. You are supposed to wear your seatbelts. But people do not do it. And for that same friend, they, there was an accident. And because he did not wear his seatbelt, he actually hit his head on the um, windshield of the car and like got like a bump. And since then, he has learned you know, to wear his seatbelts and whatnot. Um, the issue so of child restraints. Um, I think SC so, is more... So, child restraints now, the issue of child restraints. Now, mm -hmm. this, is a, this is part of our law, and it's, it's kind of a, a new culture for Guyanese because in, in more modern societies like the United States, and so, it's absolutely a requirement. You cannot have a child in a vehicle without having that child properly um, buckled and the, the proper child restraint installed or in the vehicle. So what we're saying to members of the public we have to move in a direction this is the best practice around the world if you have children below a certain age let's say below age six seven they're still required to be in a car seat a child restraint is required you're supposed to strap them down on a car in a car seat with a seat belt strapping them down. and this is not because we want to cause you great inconvenience the studies have proven is absolutely important for safety of the passengers and especially in this case children in the vehicle um, in case there's a sudden stopping of the vehicle um, certainly the child restraint would go a far way of saving that child maybe from some serious injury or even minor injuries as the case may be all right thank you so let's say god forbids someone gets into an accident the accident occurs and in that moment there is a procedure which must be followed it's you know there's a duty to stop in the case of an accident and other duties now many people are not familiar with this um just yesterday i saw on the news that the guy in the police force is looking for someone because they fled the scene um you know after an accident so if you could expound on this for us now what what is your duty when an accident occurs you have an, a duty when an accident occurs to stop and in the first um, instance before anything render assistance in instances where there's some injury or the person is perceived to be injured you have an obligation to render assistance and that assistance can come in the form of maybe calling the emergency services or perhaps even you taking the person to the hospital we wouldn't suggest that you do that because we have emergency services now because we don't want you to compromise uh the accident scene as the case may be by moving your vehicle but you have an obligation for us to render assistance secondly you have to where if it's a situation where there's no injury and it's just an accident between vehicles you have an obligation to exchange names addresses phone numbers and your insurance company each motor vehicle uh, operator so does your second obligation and thereafter you have an obligation to report the accident to the nearest police station where the accident occurred right and thereafter you have an obligation when you're there reporting um 
the accident to give an accurate uh, statement of what exactly transpired. Now there are instances where two parties can decide when an accident happens that you want to have the matter amicably resolved. That is always possible. But what we're saying to you, these are your fundamental obligations when an accident occurs. You, when an accident occurs, it's not for you to just flee and leave the scene or disappear, leave the vehicle abandoned. That is against the law. In fact, it would work against you. Let's say we, we later find you and you're taken before the court, you will have some difficulty trying to get bail because you will you will be seen as a flight risk because you left the, the, the accident scene and so on. So it will inure to your benefit unto all of us if um, you stay on the scene and render the type of, of assistance that is really required um, under the law. And is there a specific time within which you must make this report to the uh, police station? Well, not necessarily, because you may have instances where, depending on circumstances, where a person is injured. I remember the health of that person is more paramount than actually making the report. So let's say, for example, uh, you hit someone and they're injured and they have to be taken to the hospital. The traffic officer, when they come on the scene, they will have to monitor that person's situation. But certainly, the person who um, is not injured can certainly make their report at the earliest possible time, maybe shortly after the accident. All right, thank you. Um, the 2014 Amendment Act the, yeah. introduced a demerit point system. Now, I read recently in the newspapers that uh, someone wrote a letter to the editor stating that if we have a point-based system which punishes you based on the number of points you accumulate based on the amount of offenses which you uh, um, occur, then that's how you are charged or, or how you are punished, right? But many people are not aware that th this system exists within um, yeah. our legislation, the demerit yeah. point system. So if you could uh, explain to us what is the demerit point system and how does it operate? Certainly. So here again, I start off by saying, Richard, that you know, the government is at work and persons may feel as though the government is sleeping, What the government is not sleeping, the government is at work. It is actually legislation passed by the National Assembly in 2014, which addresses the issue of uh, point demerit system. So how it works. So if you have a number of violations, let's say uh, you have, uh, it, you, you, you were found um, in violation of the motor vehicle road traffic accumulation, the careless driving, in relation to obstructing traffic, in relation to not wearing a seatbelt, each of those offenses carry a demerit point system. I know, for example, if you drive in a careless manner, I think it's six points as proposed. If you drive uh, uh, obstructing traffic, it will be four points. If you drive without wearing a seatbelt, two points. And as you accumulate demerit points, it automatically, uh, the law will kick in by operational law if you, let, let's say, meet about... Uh, 15 or 20 demerit points. I'm just giving you an example. That's not the exact figure. It all depends on the circumstances. Your license can and will be suspended. I'm, I'm not saying automatically. It will then be taken before a magistrate and it will be presented to the magistrate in terms of all the demerit points that they've discovered in relation to you and your license can be suspended. The law is built into that um, system a situation where you can appeal but what we're saying to you members of the public the we do have in our legal framework and architecture the notion of a demerit point system for traffic violations so if you uh, if you accumulate a number of demerit points your license can ultimately be suspended for a few months as the case may be and if you are a habitual person and you continue to do it you can be disqualified from um, driving on our roadways Okay, that's uh, very informative there. I guess that comes back to the execution of the um, point system. The execution well. of the law. Right. More recently, in uh, 2022, we saw the, the, the 2022 Amendment Act introducing new offenses and penalties and um, increasing the fees in relation to offenses under the um, Act. So... I wanted to touch on this a little. 
One thing specifically is the creation of a new offense called Moto Manslaughter. If, if you could briefly explain to us what, what does this mean, Moto Manslaughter, and, and the elements of liability which must be satisfied to, for someone to be charged with this. Okay, so you have to think of uh, Moto Manslaughter in the sense of what we know as manslaughter in the criminal sense. It's just moto in the sense of, on a road. So we're talking about a situation where you did not intend to kill, but you were certainly reckless or careless as to the way you operated. And as a consequence, you caused the death of a person on the road. So we're moving away from the notion of causing death by dangerous driving because you have instances where persons when you look at the evidence before you and I'll give you an example can be considered as reckless as reckless endangerment of other members of the road let's say for example you are a citizen of Guyana we live in this wonderful land called Guyana and you decide that one night you will go on a drinking spree knowing full well that alcohol and um, driving under the influence of alcohol is a, an offense in the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act. But yet, you choose to do that. And as a consequence, whilst you were drunk, extremely drunk, whilst you were drinking for, let's say, 10 hours and then decided to go in your car, you went into your motor vehicle and caused the death of four persons. Now, in that sense, in that sense, given the factual circumstances, they may very well be outraged in relation to a person who would have done that and caused the death of a person or a number of persons. And in that context, the question is, okay, he might not have been certainly intentional that he went out there to kill four persons, but certainly his conduct was such at a high level of recklessness that the parliament in its wisdom to include now in our laws the whole issue of motor manslaughter so as to send a message to the members of the public this is not a behavior that is acceptable this is not a behavior that we ought to tolerate I, I certainly think I don't think it's a behavior that right thinking members of the Guyanese society would say yes to so in that context that is why the introduction of motor manslaughter is now part and parcel of our legal architecture certainly um there will be other issues that will come up but if persons are charged with it those issues can be dealt with at the level of the director of public prosecutions and so but in a nutshell that is what is targeting behavior by drivers that is certainly unbecoming and uh it's kind of tantamount to a high level of either gross um, negligence or total disregard for life Right, and, and the act also introduces the offense of causing grievous bodily Even harm bodily while harm. driving under the influence of alcohol yeah. or a drug. Um, if, if you could touch on this a little. So, you know, um, I don't know if Ms. Passard, you want to chime in on this, but you know, um, we have the whole issue of alcohol use, as I just mentioned. You may not kill someone, but you may drive your vehicle in such a manner that you cause serious bodily injury. And I, I need to make a point here. A lot of times our focus would usually be on an accident and a, a, on persons who might have died. And we, we know that is serious. But a lot of times the focus is not on those persons who are injured, who might have lost a leg, an arm, or can't walk anymore. That is an that is an impact on our society in terms of the contribution those persons or that persons could have made positively to Guyana. So in that sense, Parliament is saying to you, if you go out there and you drive to, whether you use alcohol or you use a drug, you use some illicit drug that causes, causes your judgment to be impaired, and as a consequence of that, you cause serious injury to a person, Parliament is saying to you, consequences will flow and the consequences that will flow are very severe in terms of the penalties which Parliament is looking at. So what we're saying to members of the public, we're here to tell you that this is now part of our legal architecture. And we're saying to you, 
you have to think twice about going out there, driving your motor vehicle while it's on the influence of alcohol, and possibly causing either death, the death of a person, or injury to members of the public. Right. And given that we are on the note of drink and drive or, or drug, more so because some persons are of the opinion that the law prescribes for alcohol use but but not drug use right um but there were consequential amendments which were made to the procedural provisions of the act dealing with uh testing of the breath and blood of the accused yeah. um at, at the time of um an accident and i i don't know if you were miss Bassard would like to el elaborate on on this a Ms. little Bassard? Um, so, initially, um, I knew that it would have been a gazetted officer who was the one to conduct the breathalyzer test, but with this new amendment, a constable is now allowed to conduct this breathalyzer test, and it also provides that this constable, before initiating or having this breathalyzer test conducted, he must ensure that the machine that he's using is calibrated. Because at the end of the day, to secure the conviction, the accuracy of this breathalyzer machine, it must be accurate. Um, any machine, to be accurate, it must be either serviced or whatever the case may be. But in this instance, it must be calibrated. I know um, the Gary Best situation where I think someone was knocked down. I think it was uh, by a cyclist. Um, he actually got off. He was acquitted of um, driving under the influence of alcohol solely because that machine that the police officers used, it was not calibrated. So this amendment kind of, not, it's not exactly a loophole, but it ensures that that procedure is followed, which is an integral procedure in ensuring the accuracy of the breathalyzer machine. Right. So, now that we're on the offenses, and um, mm -hmm. there's another integral part which the 2022 Amendment Act um, introduces is the increase of fines. Mm -hmm. Because um, the fines were significantly low yeah. uh, prior to the enactment of, of this piece of legislation for a first time offender, it was 30 to $60,000 or imprisonment to 12 months and for, for a subsequent conviction it was from 40 to $80,000 and um, imprisonment. We, of course persons wouldn't want to go and pay a substantial amount of money because um, you know they, they're charged and you know lose out there so if you could just inform the public of what these fines are now uh, and you know how this should be a deterrent to them so initially in the old act i know for causing that not necessarily causing that by dangerous driving but any other offense the fines were very negligible it was like 30 to 60 thousand but with this new amendment it ranges from 200 thousand to 300 thousand which is a deterrent for people additionally something that the act also has is that if you are charged not necessarily convicted but once you're charged for motor manslaughter, causing um, grievous bodily harm under the influence of alcohol, I can't remember what exactly else, just simply driving under the influence of DUI charge. Once you're charged for a second time, your license can be suspended pending the matter in the magistrate's court. Right, and, and to be specific, this uh, 200,000 fine for first time conviction, well, not le not less, less than, than two hundred thousand, and and not less than three hundred thousand for subsequent um conviction. This is in relation to the offense of driving a motor vehicle under the influence of drink or drug, to such as an extent as to be incapable of having proper control of um the, the, motor, the, vehicle. the motor vehicle, right? So, uh, I don't know if. Uh, there are any specific aspects of, of the legislation that you wish to touch on before I move on? So, so um, Richard, what I wanted to say, when you look at the legislation there, you see Parliament, in its wisdom, is trying to address certainly behavior, human behavior, conduct. 
And we as Guyanese, um, you know, sometimes we casually say only in Guyana. But that, that, that concept has to change in the sense that we all have to be our brother's keeper, right? So when you go on the road, you have to make sure. In, in fact, there's a concept that we know in law, and Ms. Passat can confirm this, um, when you're looking at torts, you say, who in law is my neighbor? And if you narrow it down to the, the road, all other road users in law will become your neighbor. So you must, you have to become your neighbor's keeper. So you have to look out for one another. So it, it addresses the concept of behavior one and number two. It says to you, members of the public, to all of us, members of the public, that look, you cannot in your right mind go out there as a right thinking member know you're under the influence or maybe you don't even know because you're completely um, mm -hmm. not the master of your own mind and try to operate a motor vehicle that is just a no-no and if the fines are there and they've been increased parliament is saying to you we hope this serves as a deterrent to, certainly for you to stop this type of behavior right um, also and i just like to chime in in addition when this act was amended they also implement well they added they implement actually amended the intoxicating liquor license act mm -hmm. to kind of work in conjunction with this amendment because as as you said we must be our neighbor's keeper and the police they can only do so much and road users i mean people are reckless so the amendment to the liquor license act kind of places a duty on bar owners waitresses um bartenders to not serve alcohol to people who are seemingly drunk to the bar owners they're supposed to put signs in their bars saying not to drink and drive um if they know somebody is a known driver they should not sell alcohol to them so those were some other things that were added by the government to ensure and to ensure the safety of our road users. Yes, and that, that's, that's a comprehensive piece of legislation which mm -hmm. we might be able to scrutinize in another episode mm -hmm. of um, this mm -hmm. program. Now, one last thing on the motto, uh, the, the, uh, the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act that I would want to touch on is... Um, the 2023 Amendment Act, mm -hmm. and this the 2023 Amendment Act has introduced electric cycles mm -hmm. um, into the legislation. Um, what what could you take us through this, and what does this mean exactly? So what it means is this, um, Richard. Um, we all would have seen as road users, persons using these bikes, these train bikes. We know they're electric bikes, but they were using those bikes and those bikes were coming and being sold without any mechanism and regime for registration so for example if they got into an accident with you they got injured they don't they don't require to have an insurance policy they're not registered with the relevant authority so they were somewhere out there um in a world by themselves so what the amendment has done now is to bring them into the fold of our legislation to say even you owners of e-bikes you have to be registered so that we can be able to monitor you because for example now if you as an e-bike owner now registered you ride your e-bike in a manner that is careless well you will then be subject to the law now because you fall on the legal regime of the motor vehicle and road traffic act so it's brought them basically within the strict power of you just like every other uh, road user under the Motor Vehicle and Road Traffic Act. So all the laws apply to them also now. Certificate of fitness, maybe they require insurance and those type of things. And and this is, this is a necessity because we have seen errant road users uh, utilizing, operating these vehicles. Sometimes they have two, three persons, persons on the on vehicle. Them. Sometimes they're on the wrong side of the road. No helmets. No helmets, you know. And and this, this, this has to be a necessity, right? Well, I think we've covered quite a bit in relation to offenses and penalties um, in relation to the legislation. But the, the government is now moving in a advanced way, um, a modern way, to um, 
charge persons or, or you know to execute um, penalties in, in when persons are charged with offenses on under the um, legislation so what what is being introduced is something called the e-ticketing uh, system uh, for traffic violations. Um, when the Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs expounded on this recently, and I saw an article published um, just yesterday in the Guyana Chronicle on this that it, it's going to go in effect um, quite soon. And if, if we drive on the Mandela to Eccles, the new um, highway there, you would see the cameras yeah. um, as you passed. Um, if if we could touch base a little on this, um, and and be, feel free to just go into it. Well, it's certainly it's certainly welcome. It's a game changer in all respectful view, because what it does uh, in real time, it captures a violate a violating member of the public who drives without a seatbelt or who perhaps is. Um, driving um, whilst using a handheld device. So it captures you, and what, what it does to you is, um, it says to you, we're not taking you to court anymore of the long, the long way. It's more efficient now. So in a way, it's reducing the court's backlog and burden to have to deal with members of the public. What we're saying to you now, you will be sent an e-ticket, whether to your address or uh, your place of abode, and that e-ticket, E ticket as I understand it will be done through the MMG uh, platform in terms of payment. Um, just just recently I was at uh, the opening of the Vigilance um, Magistrates Court and the same e-payment system will be used for payments of maintenance affiliation and so on. So certainly with the introduction of that it not only will um, reduce because we think mem members of the public and drivers will be more aware now that if i do violations i will uh, be picked up by a camera and i will be um have to be subject to a fine but it ties into what we discussed earlier if you have a number of violations or unpaid ticket and when we go to the point the merit system we can eventually move to the point if you are an errant or delinquent road user of suspending your license and once your license is suspended you ought not to be able to operate on a roadway so certainly in terms of efficiency in terms of um, changing in terms of the timing and use of certain things the e-ticketing system will be a perfect system we know um, it's now being introduced and we may have some teething problems but we certainly feel it will certainly be a game changer right it, it definitely and you know the, the country is now moving in a technologically well, advanced state um, recently we've seen legislation enacted in the last sitting of our um, national assembly um, such as the data protection um, act and the electronic communication and transactions act and yeah. all of these are legislation which we will touch on um, in the future as the program goes on I'm looking at the time here and uh, it seems as though we're coming to the end yeah. but before I wrap up I would invite both of you to share your views or if you have any comments um, to make. I love Ms. Prasad to go first. Um, so in Guyana, our most important resource is our human resource. And every single day to get from point A to point B, you need to utilize the roads, whether you're a pedestrian, a cyclist, a driver, a passenger. So I would just like to encourage people. The laws are there. They're there to protect you. They're in no way intending to just be harsh or oppressive as some people may say that the law is it's literally just to protect you and everyone around you um i know in guyana truck drivers on the east bank they're very much reckless minibus drivers taxi drivers i feel everyone needs to kind of exercise the five c's um which is care caution courtesy common sense and consideration. consideration i feel like a lot of minibus drivers especially they do not exercise common sense i don't think you'd have common sense if you're driving on the pave making a next line for yourself born in front of people to just save one second that one second you're trying to save could result in somebody dying a young person that who could have probably been the president of guyana and every day we see it's a lot of young people those are the persons drinking and driving on the roadways and only recently a young guy that's like close friends with people that i know he 
died just simply because somebody couldn't withhold themselves to drink and drive and i know how much i impacted his family and everyone around them and the psychological issues that people have to deal with i know he was with his friend in the car i can't imagine what his friend has to deal with knowing that one of his closest friends died and he survived simply because and i think that person actually got off of the dui charge just because the breathalyzer machine wasn't calibrated so i also encourage the police officers to ensure that you follow your procedures and you ensure that people act in accordance with the law okay, thank you should i uh, ask you in my view like I, I said i start off again by saying i welcome this initiative by the honorable attorney general and the government of Guyana, and it is our hope that as we go along, we'll be able to provide the necessary uh, um, information to members of the public. And more importantly, I want to say um, to our important partners like the Guyana Police Force, I know some, a lot of times they come in for flack, but these are the men and women who go out there on a daily basis. And sometimes when we are sleeping, they're keeping us safe in every, in every respect. Um, even on uh, in relation to traffic because sometimes you out there and if, if you're out on the road even one o'clock in the morning there's an accident police officers have to respond force responders have to respond so I want to say to the members of the public let us try to engender uh, an attitude and a culture of uh, uh, respect for each other and I think if we understand that and maybe it has to start in our schools we have to go back there and we did um, mention at the beginning, I think you mentioned, going forward, the government is looking at establishment of uh, like road safety corridors, issues of that nature, looking at uh, uh, road traffic in a more finer way. Like, for example, it, the hours of work and time for those uh, truck drivers, taxi drivers, minibus drivers, those are things that the government certainly have on the agenda and the radar. But I want to thank you, Richard, for having us for the first program. And we hope that we've done some bit of uh, justice to the program and to help the members of the public. Thank you. Well, thank you, SG, and thank you, uh, Shania. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, SG, that you know this, this program here, um, a concept um, initiative by the government of Guyana um, and our Honorable Attorney General, um, is definitely going to go far away to educate the ordinary citizens of their rights and um, to let them know of the provisions of the law which they must um, obey as well. Um, if anyone has any suggestions, general members of the public that is, um, you could feel free to reach out to me um, on social media or uh, uh, yeah, social media pages or email. I'll leave that on the um, screen. Um, and this here is an interactive program. It's basically a, having a conversation to let the people know that this is what is in place to protect them. This is what is in place to you know help them or, or these are their rights. Um, like I said at the beginning, our government um, has an aggressive legislative agenda and so many modern complex laws are being passed and it's it is unreasonable to expect an ordinary um, layman or ordinary citizen to be kept abreast with all of these provisions sometimes you have one legislation with a hundred and something pages 200 pages and offenses are contained in there and so hopefully through this program we could reach as much people as possible and a wide cross-section to enlighten and educate as far as possible. Uh, thank you for joining us um, on this program. My name is Richard Bainey. I, I was your host and with me I had the Solicitor General, Mr. Nigel Hawk, and an attorney in waiting, Ms. Shania Passad. Uh, see you again. Until next time, this is Simplifying the Law.